This week, we welcome Ev Kontsevoy, the co-founder and CEO of Teleport, to discuss the role of human behavior in security and the future. In the security news, telco breach from the land down under. UK government sits out bug bounty boom, but welcomes vulnerability disclosure. Data extortion groups. Uh, let's see, we're going to also talk about Edward Snowden. How Amazon's three hours of inaction cost cryptocurrency holders a whole bunch of money. SimSwapper was abducted and beaten. Uh, the Hacker Factor blog has a new announcement for analyzing metadata. Uh, what's behind the different names for hacker groups? When ransomware meets IoT, Sophos firewall security flaw, Zoho manage engine remote code execution vulnerability, new firmware vulnerabilities affect millions of devices, and so much more. On this episode of Paul's Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where exploits run wild, packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the cocktails flow steady. It's Paul's Security Weekly. FlexTrack is the premier pen test reporting and collaboration platform, empowering your team to spend more time hacking and less time reporting. FlexTrack centralizes your data, streamlines tedious workflows, automates report building, and facilitates communication with stakeholders. To learn how you can achieve a 30% increase in efficiency and cut report cycles by up to 65%, head to securityweekly.com forward slash PlexTrack. Claim your free month of PlexTrack and get your copy of the Writing a Killer Penetration Test Report Guide today. Right now, everybody is talking about cryptocurrency, and the cyber criminals are hiding in the conversation. Cyber criminals use social engineering loaded with urgency and fear to successfully prey on your company, your employees, and your customers. Spear phishing is just one of 13 types of email threats. Barracuda has identified these 13 types and shows you how you can protect your company, your customers, and your reputation. Find out about the 13 email threat types and Barracuda email protection. Get your free ebook at securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. And welcome to the show. And I don't have anything witty to say this week because just it's been one of those days. And, but I'm sure somebody who has something witty to say would introduce you to Paul Asadorians. Here he is. Welcome everyone to Paul Security <laughs> Weekly. It's episode number 757 recorded on September 28th, 2022 right here in G Human Studios in Rhode Island to my left. None other than Mr. Larry Pesce. Hey. <laughs> Good to have you, man. Yeah. It's a uh, been interesting afternoon, that's all. Like, yes. Yeah. Been quite the uh, adventure. You got here though. That's, I, that's I the got here. Part. Yeah. Yeah. What happened, Larry? Oh, I had I had a um, um, moment. Um, well, I, I work from home, so I don't drive a lot. And uh, apparently, last week on the way to the show, I'm guessing that my alternator grenaded, um, and the batteries weren't charging in my truck. So I got in the car to Is that come like here. Ultra grenaded. Yes. So I got <laughs> I've gotten the car to got in the truck to come here, and I got a mile down the road, and then all sorts of lights flash on the dashboard, and then the dashboard turned off. And no power, and like barely hit enough. Like, like you floor it, and nothing happens. Like it goes two miles an hour, and then four miles an hour. So, well, I hope you get that taken care of. And you got here, which is the <laughs> important here. part. Yep, thank you. My my wife's sixteen year old car got me here. There you go. <laughs> On the lines remotely, Mr. Josh Marpet is here with us. Josh, welcome. <laughs> Pleasure. And the advantage of doing remote is I'm in my garage. I didn't have to drive anywhere to get here. That's right. Also reporting in from home remotely, though, Mr. Adrian Sanabria is joining us this evening. Adrian, welcome. I did have to drive to get here because I had to take my youngest to work. So you had to drive so back, to, back home. Yeah, yep, you had to drive. Yeah, and I, I thought I was avoiding the traffic on, on the way back home, but I wasn't. So I was a little bit worried about getting here in time, but oh, I did. But you thank you. We thank you for being here. But you're back at Hogwarts, so you're, oh. you're all good. <laughs> yeah, so the the lighting is going in uh, right Ooh. now, and it's it's uh, uh, not as easy as I thought it was going to be. All all the wires and lights are teeny tiny, mm. you know, and everything has to like squeeze in between the Legos. And because you want it to look good, there's just an amazing amount of work that goes into like like, like there's these little bits of uh, um, dual sided tape, double sided tape. Uh, little tiny like 
you know, half centimeter by half centimeter squares that you have to shove up inside a Lego and then you have to stick a light to it. And then you tug too hard on the cable and it comes unstuck. And like a lot of it's tweezer work. It's like building a ship in a bottle. It's oh, crazy. Gosh. And that's the I'm Lego. sure it'll look amazing once it's done, but it's, it's, uh, I think all told there's something like 590 steps in the process. Wow. And that's the Lego set behind you. Yeah, it's the second largest Lego set they make. Wow. So, uh, what, what, I forget how many pieces. It's, it's over 6,000 pieces. I think the largest is that Death Star? Star Destroyer that's like six oh, feet long. Star yep. Destroyer. Gotcha. Yep. Amazing. Uh, don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings at securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. This segment is sponsored by Teleport. You can find more about Teleport and their amazing products by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash teleport. Ev Consovoy is the co-founder and CEO of Teleport, jo Teleport even, joining us to discuss a more radical approach to infrastructure security, getting rid of secrets entirely, and moving access control based on physical properties of humans and machines. Ev, welcome to Paul Security Weekly. Thank you for having me. It's great to be. I used bicycle to get to the office today simply because I wanted to be on this podcast so bad. I didn't want to get anything mechanical or electrical in the way. So that's right. I picked the most reliable form of transportation. And it's very green. That's awesome. Ev, how did you get your start in information security? How did I get my start in information security? Um, actually, like my entire career, since I was maybe 20 years old, I always enjoyed building tools for other engineers. Uh, started my career at a company called National Instruments. You see, the word instrument is in the name. So, and I love doing it simply because from my perspective, like engineers are at the forefront of progress, like forward, making everything nicer, increasing everyone's productivity and happiness. Uh, so information security basically falls into this uh, uh, kind of bigger bucket. So I've always been doing it, always enjoyed doing it, but um, started focusing on security probably when I ended up at the Rackspace uh, like a few years ago uh, before starting this company, because at the time I was uh, one of the largest cloud providers. So you basically get exposed to uh, security almost every day. So it's hard to ignore and it's very painful, uh, not only to be hacked, but it's also very painful to use security solutions, which is probably something we're going to talk about it today. Mm. What what happened to Rackspace? Did they get what happened to Rackspace? Yeah. What do you mean? Let me. Are they still? Let's clarify this question. It's it's but really I feel broad. Like they started out like before cloud, where literally you would rent Rackspace. Um, remember there was a startup. I think it was called Slicehost. Yeah, yeah, I remember Slicehost. I think it was like one of the original VPC companies. So Rackspace acquired uh, Slicehost. Um, I don't remember when. Feels like maybe like 2010 ish. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they built their cloud offering, uh, kind of based on that uh, kind of team. And they started OpenStack project, if you remember what that was. And uh, and they were really nicely was the time when I joined uh, Rackspace. But uh, if you want to be in a kind of cloud computing game, if you want to compete with AWS, scale is everything. Like everything is, like economy of scale is a really, really kind of obvious concept. And it's extremely important if you try to be in that business. So Rackspace, in my opinion, was just simply too small, too small to compete. This is why, like, we actually don't have any small cloud providers. Like, we're looking at Azure, which is Microsoft, obviously, yeah. massive operation. We're looking at uh, Google, uh, which arguably was probably the first cloud. Um, and then AWS, Amazon, also giant company. People even say that even smaller players like uh, IBM are having a hard time uh, competing with those big three. Mm. It's so Rackspace basically, instead of trying to compete head on, they uh, they started uh, concentrating on what historically they've done well. That's basically managing people's workloads mm -hmm. um, because there's uh, kind of over like like a big problem looming over everyone's head is just talent shortage. Um, it's getting cheaper and cheaper to build software because the tools are getting better. There's just a lot of open source, but it's getting more and more expensive to actually run software in production. Because complexity of everything is going up, you know, with Kubernetes and containers and like the average tech stack today includes so many different components. So everyone is kind of struggling to stay in production. And that's what Rackspace uh, is helping uh, their customers on all kinds of clouds. That's that's their uh, 
business model today. Although I'm not really uh, connected to Rackspace anymore. Don't yeah. quote me on anything I just said. But no, I think it's. <laughs> but I think it's interesting, Ev. You know, and I, I'm glad to hear you say this because sometimes I feel overwhelmed when we look at deploying an application and you've just got so many options. And I feel like back in the day. I was like, oh, I need a lamp stack. So like a <laughs> lamp, like, yeah. Right? Like I need a couple of VMs. I need a web server, an app server, a database. Like I can get my arms around this. And that was the whole thing. Now when you push applications into the cloud, everything is a service. I can script everything and have this vast amounts of infrastructure. And it's got like in so complex. Is it just it's not just me, right? Yeah, like when I got my first job at a SaaS company. We didn't even have like staging or production environments. We had staging and production servers. Like we had one box somewhere in the data center. That was our production box. Right, right. <laughs> and then we had a staging box. And there was no deployment. It was just like copy, like the binaries or whatever. That was deployment. We just, like we see, like the word deployment was, it was not even a thing. So that's how simple everything was. Like you just uh, copy some files and here you go. You're running a li latest version. Mm. Now it's vastly different. We have a lot of, a lot of infrastructure, and I think we've, you know, it's interesting. When I the thing about what you folks do at Teleport, we've had this problem since the beginning of time, since like the invention of computers. Like, how do we, it, when once we got more than like one or two computers that we could log into, we've had this problem at scale of how do I authenticate and manage all of these different computers and services too that started increasingly i mean it's interesting to look way back in history we might have had one one giant mainframe all the way to today where i've got a million microservices and stuff running all over the place i like that you use that word mainframe look i i know it's it's old and it's not cool but with the kind of most really really old things the older they get they start becoming cool again so so here's my take i think uh we're now starting to realize that the internet itself is turning into one giant mainframe, doesn't it? Mm. Um, like from a like the end user perspective, when we interact with all of these different things that live in what we call cloud, it feels like cloud is, is just like one place where you could put things. Obviously, things get distributed and we have CDNs and then like um, the, the location of individual uh, servers are, doesn't matter, but the overall experience is now starting to resemble like we're interacting with this one giant mainframe. And if that's the case, then you could start comparing internet to your own laptop, can't you? Because if you think that the internet is one giant machine and then your laptop is also a machine, and then you can start to see like what what is the delta, like what are we missing? So from a security perspective, so how do you access your laptop? So the access basically means four things. Like there's a way to like physically connect to the machine, like connectivity. So then there is authentication, like you need to prove that you are who you claim you are. Then there's authorization. What can you do with this machine? And then there's audit, like your laptop keeps the log of everything you're doing, right? So what is that access interface for the internet? Because the internet does not have a single connectivity option, right? Because internet consists of like thousands and thousands of components, like servers, microser microservices, databases. Um, so there is not a single connectivity option because they're all located in many different places. So then there is no single login. You can just log in into the internet if you're an engineer. Like you have one authentication system for I know, SSH, you have another one for um, Kubernetes, then you have another one for MongoDB or for MySQL, and the list goes on and on and on. Then you like open Jenkins UI, it has its own login. Um, and there is no single audit. So the internet, like mm. that's basically the kind of what we're trying to um, that gap is what we're trying to bridge with teleport. Yeah, and I, I want every. I, I, mm -hmm. Wow, my microphone's really loud. What? Um, I just, <laughs> it, but I can't go into Amazon's data center and log into my computer in the cloud either, right? I mean, you can. <laughs> I <but>. mean, maybe <laughs> you might. It might be hard. But, but <laughs> do you want to? Yeah. Like, wouldn't you want to do that though? Remotely, right? I was just comparing it to the laptop model. Like, I th I actually think it's an interesting comparison of like. I can log into my laptop or some kind of server or system um, and, and physically log in and then get access to all my applications and maybe have to authenticate to each each one of those on my physical computer. I don't really have that in the cloud. Everything is remotely ex accessed in the cloud. Servers. Yeah, the CISOs, yeah, the CISOs, they oftentimes use the term uh, um, access silos. 
that we have this access silos in our organization. Like the, to access Kubernetes engineers use this system for access servers in production. We have this thing and staging over there. And then you, you have this kind of different silos for, this is what we use for Azure. This is what we use for our own, for our kind of co-located co uh, resources. So it's, it's, it's a big problem. And can you have described like traditionally, how have we accessed these systems and what are some of the challenges with that? I mean, most of us have been in some kind of systems administration role, you know, traditionally, mm -hmm. but what are some of, I mean, well, we, we know some of those, those challenges. Let's talk about right? jump boxes, jump boxes. <laughs> SSH. Oh God. How jump. many people did I just, just trigger? <laughs> so like the definition of traditional definitely uh, depends on your background, right? So um, if you come from IT background, maybe you use the kind of privileged access management systems, uh, kind of the old school way of doing things like, like CyberArk is maybe a good example. But if you talk to like a bunch of Linux folks, like they would probably mention that, hey, like we would basically have uh, something based on private public key infrastructure that you have basically um, like a bunch of engineers and they have like private keys in their laptops and they're trying to get into some jump uh, into some boxes in a data center using some jump host, which is basically just an, another Linux box. Like we would be, you would probably discover um, a lot of uh, situations where people use combination of kind of passwords or kind of passwords with kind of multi-factor authentication. So like the legacy is, is not even uh, like the traditional way for many, many, many companies today is still the way. That's kind of something that I wanted to highlight. But the interesting thing that I would love to talk about is like, what are the traditional problems that exist with all of these traditional approaches? You want to talk about that? I do, because I think it <laughs> comes down to, I mean, not just key management, but see, key, what's the difference between key management, secrets management, and certificate management? I guess is my um, So that's a... Uh, because the difference are basically going to be uh, basically feature based differences, but I will want to like I, I want to draw like one big difference for two for two different types of access. The secret based access, the type of access that you get into, like for example, you get into infrastructure because you have some kind of secret information that someone else doesn't have. That secret information could be uh, a password, it could be a private key. It could be like a very secret URL, like a session token. The browser cookie is another form of secret information. So like all of them are traditional and all of them are, in our opinion, legacy. And all of them are basically part of our everyday lives. Um, and what happens if you do this is that it stops working at a certain scale. So just imagine if you are running, let's say, let's pick like, like a giant internet company like Google or Facebook. Like, one of those. So imagine yourself running infrastructure at that scale over time. So you start small and then you grow into being a giant. What you will start to realize that, okay, so people are trying to hack me. And then if you try to imagine that the formula defines the probability of you, your organization being hacked today. So start thinking about inputs, like what goes into that formula? How can you determine the probability of getting hacked? And you will realize that the probability of human error is the most important component of that formula. So someone opening like a phishing email, someone opening the attachment they're not supposed to open, clicking on the wrong link, or simply selling their credentials on black market, which also happens, by the way. So probability, that basically means that humans are the weakest link. The question then is, how do you bring down probability of human error? Okay, you could say, we're going to use better tools. We're going to uh, do uh, we will hire better people like recruiting like we will raise our standards we will do training by doing all of these things you're bringing that probability down but it never gets to zero which is really really important because it never gets to zero it means that if you double your infrastructure footprint or if you double workforce so instead of having 50 engineers you have 100 and then 200 and then four the probability is going to go back up to where it was and then it will go even higher and higher. And eventually, as you continue to scale, the probability of human error will effectively become one or 100, which means that you will get hacked today. So how do you prevent that? 
the thing is that you cannot change human behavior. Like humans will reliably continue to be humans. They will be making mistakes. So instead then, you look at like what are the consequences of uh, a human error. And you will see that the most common one, the catastrophic one, is a secret, some kind of secret leaking uh, outside of your organization. So through a phishing campaign, like uh, your employee credentials might be harvested, or if they got someone like just, a Trojan through attachment on, on their just... laptop, the private key might be stolen or browser cookies might be stolen. So now you could start thinking, I need to make sure that there are no secrets in my organization. So the probability of you getting hacked is closely tied to how many secrets you have on employee laptops and engineering laptops and servers everywhere. So if you manage to get rid of all of the secrets, bring your surface area of secrets down to zero, then it means that human error doesn't matter anymore. Um, that's basically what we think about it. Yeah, I mean, certainly there's a lot of it. I mean, secrets end up in GitHub repositories and, and the like. Um, how, how do we fix that problem though? Like how Because uh, I feel like a certificate is just a glorified secret. Help me understand that. <laughs> so yes and no. So <clears throat> by, by the way, it's uh, you just said something that resonated with me. So you mentioned that like the secrets are not just like passwords and private keys. Like we have secrets embedded in our code, right? Mm -hmm. We have things like API keys that are sitting uh, in a, like private Git repositories. Um, but also keep in mind too that it 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 it's helpful to go back to the fact that it's human error really that we are uh, paying attention to right because if your application is getting hacked uh, because you have like vulnerability in it like cross site scripting attack vulnerability that's another form of human error so it's just like con like, like the, the the exercise of being a good security person is just you you keep track of all these different ways how a human can make errors and then you find solutions that make these errors. Uh, not harmful. Like the errors will will happen. You just need to prevent what what happens after. Now, going back to your um, question about how certificate is better, I think it's maybe a, <laughs> a premature question. I'm not criticizing your question. I'm just basically saying. So, if we ask ourselves, how do we get rid of secrets and what do we use instead? So the obvious answer is, uh, and I guess most people making this conclusion is, oh, we're going to use biometric, you know, the fingerprint and whatnot. Uh, so what does it mean? It means that we need to use physical properties of, of humans, but also physical properties of machines, things that are not information, things th that you cannot upload or download or clone or uh, transfer anywhere in any way. Because if you know how fingerprint authentication works, your fingerprint never turns into some kind of image. So you, it, it's the combination of TPM on your laptop and the fingerprint reading collectively, they work together. And they basically produce the answer, yes or no. Is it you or is it not you? So that information doesn't go anywhere. It's not shared. So what, it, so what I'm going with this is that if you say that you want to provide access based on physical attributes of human and machines, you, let's start by giving it a name. I would propose let's just use word identity because we already have it. So let's just make the definition of identity slightly different. So if you use identity-based based access or identity-native access. It means that you're authenticating based on the physical property of my finger and a specific TPM chip on my laptop. Now the question is, how do you train into a computer system so it will say uh, that it will actually grant or deny your access? So you can think about, now you need a mechanism, the safest possible mechanism for identity transfer from a physical world into the world of ones and zeros, the mechanism which is uh, as immune as possible for kind of theft. This is where certificates come in. I would encourage you to think about a certificate as a mechanism for identity transfer. That's all they need, uh, they're used for. And the so way how, is why like, certificate, uh huh? Is it like something you know, like the secret, something you have that then makes up the certificate? No, 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 like something you have, something you are, and something you know, that is definition of identity. Mm -hmm. That makes you, you. So something you are, that's your fingerprint. Uh, something you have, it's your maybe laptop or YubiKey, some kind of piece of hardware that cannot be like uploaded or downloaded. 
and then you could put pin on top of it or a password if you want that's like something you know yeah so that collectively so, uh, is your identity right we talked Not about this on the last show that uh the physical characteristics of your device the telemetry you know mm -hmm. the things that do like how you hold your phone where your laptop physically is we're adding this in as a component of identity i think the legacy thinking is exactly something, exactly. Have, something you know but we're adding a third dimension on top of that that's like something about the telemetry of your devices as a very the most broadest term that i can phrase that right but something that's not data that's really really important like tpm is right. not data mm -hmm. so so now we need to like find a way so this basically means that identity is stored in a physical world it's not stored in a laptop it's not stored in a database like true identity is a is a is a, is a physical thing all you have to do is find the mechanism that transfers that identity into a computer system that needs to uh that is immune to theft or as immune as possible so that's the context in which you need to be evaluating certificates and why certificate is better than for example a password the obvious reason why it's better because certificate has a lot of metadata you can attach to it mm -hmm. so your for example your the, the team like role-based access information can go into certificate metadata. So it could describe that you're an engineer. It, it, it could describe anything you want. The second thing about certificates, why it makes them safe, because they expire automatically. Mm -hmm. Or um, you could make the expiration extremely quick. So you could essentially bake like a single-use certificates that make that have no value once you've, grant, like you've been granted access. So like, now you're in, your certificate is no longer valid. You could pin certificates to a specific context, like your IP address, for example. Mm -hmm. So, which makes it again very, very unlikely that the certificate loss is going to lead to some kind of a, a breach. So, those are all the reasons why certificates are uh, much superior to secret-based approach. And there is another really, really important advantage: is that they are standardized. So, there are basically just two commonly used certificate types: X509. That gives you access to almost everything that speaks HTTP, and then you have uh, SSH certificates that are slightly different, less powerful, but nevertheless, which basically means that certificates could also be used to solve the access silo problem that we talked about earlier. So, if you authenticate using physical properties of your machine and your uh, kind of fingerprint and 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 pin, for example. I can give you certificates for um, all of the things that are inside of your cloud. So we need to access Kubernetes clusters, SSH boxes, like uh, Jenkins or databases or whatever it is that's part of your stack. So the certificates I'm gonna give you, they're all going to be synchronized. They, get, they will have exact same permissions baked into them. So you have synchronized authorization across your entire cloud footprint, and they all going to expire at the same time. Um, that is a powerful reason to use certificates, and, especially and, if you and could I want, them. I want to mm -hmm. go back because I have this issue with standards because I feel like everyone likes standards, but they only like the standards that they create for themselves and they end up creating their own standard, which defies the definition of the English word standard in, in some capacity. <laughs> the wonderful thing about standards is that we have so many of them. That's right. <clears throat> but I Relevant feel, XKCD. I feel like when we get the certificates, there is that is one area where we've done a really good job in defining a standard that that can be used for, in this case, authentication and then extended into authorization, correct? Correct, correct. I will say, though, that it's really easy to make certificates that are not com not useful outside of your own kind of little universe because they have this kind of extension mechanism, at least for yeah. nine. So you could definitely bake extensions that nobody else understands. Um, so the, the potential for a mess is definitely there, mm -hmm. just like with most standards. Right. But that's not something that we see in practice. Mm. Um, also, you know, when you say transfer my identity into the computer i just can't help but think of tron by the way I just, that's where my brain went <laughs> not what we're talking about <laughs> uh, can i let me let me throw some things at you if you don't mind um so ev you've you've got the certificate that gets you into anything cool mm -hmm. and you've got the way to authenticate to use the certificate uh, so that the system in front of me knows that it's me trying to use that certificate, right? 
Yep. And the the problem is is that when we talk about this, we talk about multiple factors of authentication, which you talked about a minute ago. And people are starting to confuse what those are. Uh, like if I use a password that comes out of a password manager on my phone, is that still something I know? Or is it because it's off my phone, it's something I have? And so when you, you mentioned, uh, and by the way, you did it fine. Please don't mistake that. You said biometric, a PIN, and, uh, a, 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 and, and, a, and a push notification or something you have notification. I forget which one you used. Uh, and you're absolutely correct. That's that's the pin you know. The the push comes from the phone that you have, and the bio, you know the fingerprint is is something you are totally correct, sir. Uh, but I mean, are are you seeing in practice anybody thinking they're doing multi-factor authentication into the certificate, and they're actually only using one factor? We talked about this last week, so I just thought it was mm -hmm. it stuck with me. I've been thinking about it. So the password manager is actually a very common shortcut that a lot of people take. Uh, so they basically don't treat it as a secret, although it is. So um, it's like quite frequently people would end up with passwords from their password managers kind of stuck in their uh, clipboards on their computers, right? So that that makes them vulnerable. Don't get me wrong, I'm not criticizing password managers. I think they are doing a very valuable job because essentially they're shrinking the surface area of your secrets. Um, it's also true with these kind of secure vaults that exist on the infrastructure side. Let's say you have 15 passwords, right? So your surface area for and like in, in, from our perspective, the, the existence of a secret is already a vulnerability. So let's just say you have 15 passwords. So you're vulnerable 15 times simply because you have them. But if you put them into some kind of vault or a password manager, and that thing itself is now protected by another password. So you see now you shrunk the surface area from 15 down to one. So you, you, you can, you, uh, that's just kind of my, my, my generic answer towards, um, uh, like, why would password manager be helpful? But in terms of when people confuse, like, we, it's definitely possible to make bad choices when you're designing a multi factor authentication. You could, for example, have all, both of like two factors, and each of them is just something you know. Then it basically means that you have two passwords, and if you concatenate them together, that basically means one giant password. So it has to be based on all of this, on this difference that we just discussed. One of them has to be something you are, like the physical object, the finger, uh, your fingerprint and a TPM on your machine. Like that has to be true. Uh, in our opinion, if you don't have that, you're already exposed. So the pin on top, like why would we add a password again if we're already using physical properties? Well, the obvious answer is because what if you, I don't know, like in the extreme case, like you're unconscious. And, and someone can actually like take, grab your hand and, and put it on the fingerprint on your own laptop, or then use your laptop to get something in. So that's really what you're protecting against if you're adding something that you know. Um, so all of these things, they have a reason. So you have to select kind of multi-factor, uh, like your multi-factor choices, they need to kind of map to your use case and your tolerance for usability pain. Yeah, it's definitely a, a scale and we should never, use sms <laughs> <laughs> and also let's also forget that there are no absolute solutions like everything mm. lives in the spectrum let's just say you use the best security like principles and you're an extremely valuable target for and let's say like a government like some some government act like a player out there they can just like, get, kidnap you they will have who you are they will have your fingerprint they will have your laptop and they will make you talk and you will share the pin there, there is no protection against it well, well, relevant maybe. XKCD, well, you know, the one where it says, <laughs> uh, yeah, $5 million wrench. Dollar board to so, crack his like, password. Here's a $5 you have... wrench, hit him until he gives it to you. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, we actually do um, refer to that uh, comic gonna, a few times in say, our you own actually hit people with a wrench. educational materials. <laughs> so so uh, I, I have another question for you. Um, you've Your system I have authenticated into the certificate. I'm, I'm bastardizing but I've authenticated into my cert. It then gets me passwordless into a server and uh, a workstation and an application. And then I'm about to hit into something that's wow, sensitive, crown jewel stuff, whatever. Uh, do you have authentication levels or authentication uptakes, uh, step ups? So yeah, yeah. So that's basically, um, I was actually about to talk about this when we talk about like you getting kind of kidnapped or whatever. So oh, it's, it, bucks. it's very smart. 
are like aliens kidnapping us and using us to access our own infrastructure simply because they just don't have the technology to hack through our defenses. Anyway, so um, it, it's a very, it would be a wise idea to not have a root, let's use that uh, word, anywhere in your organization. So let's just say that you have access to your infrastructure and you get kidnapped or whatever, or like somehow your account is, is compromised. You should design everything that an attacker will not really be able to access much. Definitely not uh, the, the kind of jewels, the, the most important so, so part of infrastructure. The way to do that is to, yes, but also to have a system that elevates your permissions on demand when you want to perform critical operations. Let's just say you have a like extremely valuable database that you that you need to access maybe once a year when when you're troubleshooting something really, really important. But on the day to day, um, in, in day to day life, it's not necessary. So what you could do, uh, you have to implement something that's called access um, request or access workflow. Like the way teleport does it, it would be something like this. Let's say you want to access this database with a like MySQL command, if it's a MySQL database. So you type MySQL and it will just kind of pause there for a sec. That's how you're going to feel it. But what it's doing behind the scenes, it's sending a request to Slack or some other thing that we would support to, to your manager or maybe your team members based on how you configure it. So multiple people would have to approve uh, mm. that you are trying to access this uh, crown jewel at this particular moment. You might be asked for a reason, like why, why are you accessing this thing? And the policy might say that you need to provide like a ticket number that you're trying to close this particular ticket. Then someone else reviews and they grant you access and then the access will be revoked the second you've done doing that job. So that is how you protect against a, a, a situation where someone somehow became you or forcing you to do something. Uh, um, so and you I, can even just, automate it actually. Uh -huh. I just want to say that like now when i think about how linux does this privilege separation it it's really absolutely horrible <laughs> compared to what you just described right because like we've got this thing called sudo but we've also got a root password and we've also got capabilities and we've also got all these other things that basically let you circumvent all of that stuff but what you're talking about is really the answer to all like basically why linux uh is well, ready for the desktop authentication and authorization is complete trash is because there's just there's so many roads in to become root. What you're saying is you gate that off into something that's actually defensible and provable to be able to do your job. Well, it's I, I think the I other would part never of it describe is... anything as trash. <laughs> like let's start there. <laughs> like like pretty smart people worked on Linux and Unix in general. But however, they did it you know, 20, 30, 40 years ago mm. when that Linux box was the, basically your entire infrastructure. It just simply doesn't like Linux or any operating system we use today, for that matter. They just don't play nicely when they're part of one giant environment, simply because they lack the context of who you are, where you're coming from, what are you trying to do. Mm. Well, a lot of these aren't new concepts either. You know, so like the idea of uh, when you're in an enterprise environment, authentication being, um, you know, something that an entire team gets involved with. You know, it, it's it's like that concept exists for pushing code to production where you need, in, in GitHub, you need a certain number of code reviews to be able to to uh, push it to your dev environment or push it to production, you know, and, and you can require those reviews. Uh, you know, kind of like uh, if you've ever worked with any kind of, like, really high security convoluted key management, there's M of N where... You know, to recover a key, you need three of five, you know, key holders. Conspiracy for sharing. Yeah, it's yeah. very similar. Actually, I, I, I mm -hmm. appreciate this comparison because the access request mechanism is extremely similar to um, pull request and Git. So if you try to merge your mm -hmm. code into them, like a, uh, the main branch, you need multiple people sometimes to do like a code review and um, and then approve it. So same thing with infrastructure access. So you're trying to access like a really, really important database. You need multiple people to approve and, and do a review of a reason why you're doing it. And obviously all of this goes into the audit log. Also, you, you mentioned something important that I want to zoom into, uh, maybe using an example, because when we say like, hey, here is this like crown jewel that let so, someone is trying to access, let's not pretend that there is a single way of accessing it. Mm. Let's play this game. I say, you have a database 
And inside of the database, there's a table that contains an extremely important data, maybe medical records. So let's count how many different ways there are to access the database. Why is it important? Because maybe you're trying to implement a very simple policy that says developers should not access customer data, right? I think it's common sense rule. Like you don't want a random Google engineer to read your Gmail, do you? So how do you go about implementing this for this table? Let's start counting. Well, a developer might use a MySQL command to connect directly to a database socket and like run SQL dump or something. That's one way of accessing. So you need to protect the like database own authentication authorization needs to be configured to implement that rule, that policy. But you can also SSH into that box and just basically uh, uh, like get that uh, uh, file from a file system to get exact same data. Or if you're using Kubernetes, you could get into that pod where a database is running using Kubernetes API. Or if you are on AWS, you could use AWS uh, API and do uh, EBS volume dump, and you can get it <laughs> out this way. Or if you have a web UI for managing the database, like you can go through a web browser through that tool, or if there is external script or maybe some kind of automation like Jenkins that periodically does backups of the database, you could go through Jenkins to get access to exact same data. <clears throat> How many doors to that table I just counted? I think like I think five, five or six. Yeah, I think we're on five. I or can six. probably find a few others. Go further, like yeah. you, you might have like a right. microservice somewhere that has database password inside of that microservice does SQL code. injection count? So those are these <laughs> access silos that I was talking about. So, and a certificate is the only way they can possibly cover every single one because certificates are supported for all of these different examples I just uh, gave you. So that's basically what Teleport does, that we allowing you to implement a policy across all of these different ways to access something. So, uh, so, so, so Teleport, sorry, Adrian, I was just gonna say Teleport isn't just about brokering user access, but also application access as well. Cause it's basically like another, another persona or role that needs to access a, a certain resource. Well, teleport, let's put it this way, it's an identity aware access proxy. Mm -hmm. So anything that could be on one side of a proxy or another side of a proxy, you could like figure out what the use cases are. Adrian? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, just um, so kind of a question and, and, you know, just another thing that I wanted to share that, that in recent years has helped me think about uh, authentication and, and authorization differently is yeah, I remember the first time somebody mentioned to me, and it's been a long time, but uh, what typically I think we have uh, thought of authorization and the authentication as hierarchical, right? Like the sysadmin has access to everything, you know, and then below that you've got maybe the DBA, you've got an application user, uh, you know, maybe a web admin somewhere in between there. Uh, you know, but but somebody mentioned to me once, why why would the sysadmin need to log into a database and look at data? You know, in, a, in most cases they don't. You know, so it's it's maybe not hierarchical. You know, and and you know, talking about the M of N thing, like using Slack to to approve access to things. You know, I think it's helpful to to like you were saying, just kind of wipe the slate clean, forget what you know about how you access systems and design it uh, more intentionally, you know, based on, you know, the, the value of the data and, and, and the, you know, the, the, the crown jewels. And, you know, especially once you consider some of these scenarios we have, like the uh, last week we covered the, we talked a lot about the Uber hack, you know, and how <laughs> that secrets uh, management tool that they had uh, should have been a lot harder to get into and shouldn't have given access to as many things as it did. Um, you see, but that's a, uh, let me push back on this a little bit. I would argue it's a slippery slope because even mm -hmm. if they would like scale it back, like how much access you get, like again, as you continue to scale your organization, there's this creep, like it's gonna come back this is our like why our view is that you shouldn't have any secrets at all. Like there should not be a secret management tool uh, because that prevent like based on what I read on a Uber attack. Like if it was based on again physical attributes of humans and machines, then this uh, would would not even be possible. Also, I want to comment on something that you said earlier, and maybe it will redeem the reputation of Linux in a few people's hands when you said about. <laughs> 
something about the hierarchical access that you have a sysadmin that has access to everything. Right. So have you ever, um, if you remember, of course, have you ever kind of looked into how postfix works? You know, on Linux, they mail a daemon. Unfortunately, that, yes. Yeah. So it yeah. has, like, it no, has multiple yes, daemons, actually, old. right? So there is one for kind of fetching. There was another for sending. So, yeah. and all, like every the single MTA. very different permissions. So the postfix is broken into what essentially are microservices. And this is a really, really old piece of software that was already designed with microservices, right? And was that, and was each, that DJ, DJB that did postfix? Unfortunately, I do not remember. No. So my point is You're right. it that was postfix, time, yeah. and it's actually very it's a common design pattern for most Unix systems to break a, like a complex beast into a bunch of small uh, daemons. And each particular daemon has minimal amount, like minimal amount of permissions to specific actions. Sorry, you could think about it as a kind of intent. Visa Venema, who I think has been on the show before. Sorry, I just I get enamored with so this. Obviously, Sorry. someone's smart because Continue. they've done it yes. properly. So, Postfix uses for each individual task it needs to perform, it uses a special daemon or a process that is given minimal permissions to complete that task. Now you can think about this model is that it's the task that has a role, not the actual piece of software. So it's the intent mm. of what are you actually doing? That thing should have enough permissions to get this done. And if you apply this to humans accessing infrastructure, so what it basically means is that, let's say you have a database that's experiencing some issues, like it needs to be trouble like you need to go to troubleshoot it. Um, so then you create like a like a task, like a, let's say ticket in the internal ticketing system. And you say like, I need to troubleshoot the while latency, like disk latency keeps increasing for this particular workload. And that ticket needs to have permissions. And then when an engineer tries to access something, um, the, the access request goes into Slack and the people responsible for approving access, they need to request, like, what do you need it for? It's like, oh, here's the ticket I'm trying to fix. And permissions are taken from that ticket and given to you temporarily to go complete that task. And when you're done, permissions are revoked. So mm -hmm. uh, it, it sounds something like new, but it's not a but new it, idea. But like it, it came like, from Linux. So we we had it, it for right? many, many years. It almost sounds very Kerberos-like as well. See, everything Similar? old everything old becomes new again. new again. Right. Yep. <laughs> yep. yep. Yeah, it, it's it's interesting. Your example before, I remember um, writing about a Casby vendor when I was an industry analyst. Uh, and I remember they, they were the first vendor that suggested uh, step up authentication within a SaaS app. So Casby's big thing back then, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what they're doing with it under the, the SASE, SASE banner now. But... Um, you know, one of the things was uh, their example was take like paychecks.com. Like if you're just logging in to look at people's salaries, stuff like that, like that takes one level of authentication. But the moment you want to change somebody's salary to a different amount or maybe uh, change a direct deposit to a different uh, uh, bank account, uh, what this CASB could do, even though paychecks.com didn't have this feature built in, is they could... Uh, apply another level of authentication because that particular uh, activity within that SaaS app uh, w was very, very sensitive. And uh, I, I thought that was that was an interesting idea that they had done there. I mean, it's, you know, it was kind of uh, inconvenient to apply, you know, because back then they were using reverse proxies to, you know, they're basically hacking these SaaS apps in, in real time <laughs> and forcing employees through this reverse proxy which uh ended up not being the the best approach uh there but uh, the idea was a good one i thought yeah and, and yeah. i want to uh, ask you a question about the like implementation because i think this is where a lot of us fall down in that when we first stand up a system or a service we're like oh, i'll just i'll use the default password and then we're like, oh that's really bad. Like I need to log into it with a password and oh, I'll SSH into that system. I really should be using a key based system. And then like, well, that's not really secure. Like I should have a, a Yubi key. So I got to push that configuration out. But like we, we get lazy and we may, mm -hmm. we may not do that for every system in every, in every service. So how can we ease the implementation? Like that's what I'm curious about teleport uh, to, to be more direct is like, 
how do you ease that authentication so that I can easily, I mean, it's hard enough to stand up a service. Now I get this extra step. I have to stand it up so that authentication is, is secure and uses this system. How can we make that like as easy as possible? Uh, so on a high level, um, I want to remind you that tele like from a teleport perspective, like individual machines are basically like computer parts. So teleport operates on a, like the basic unit of deployment is a cluster. Mm -hmm. You can think of a cluster as your computing environment. So when you set up teleport, you configure your policy, your permissions, your like kind of all of the usual things for a cluster. And then you're just enrolling machines into it. And as you enroll machine, which is easy to do, and it's actually kind of like one click operation in the latest versions, these machines, they simply inherit um, everything from their cluster. So they become uh, <clears throat> like a part of one giant box. If you, uh, if you continue to think about the entire in internet as one giant uh, mainframe. So you don't have to configure each individual machine. Right. And, so and, like and I, run a, I run a script or install a package or like you make it really easy in my deployment to go. Yeah, the way I'm going to authenticate <laughs> is this way and like just go do that kind of thing. Exactly. Exactly. So in the teleport documentation, it basically is like, like we do have instructions for how to add machine to your production environment or staging environment. Um, and you could also make it like extremely automatic, like almost uh, magical if you use like if you allow us to use AWS APIs because we can um, yeah, on Amazon, we can actually enroll machines for you mm -hmm. uh, automatically. That's awesome. Adrian, you had a question. Yeah, yeah, just kind of zooming out with um, Teleport, you know, I'm trying to understand that everything that you provide here, because it, it seems like it's, it, um, you know, correct me, or, or fill in the gaps here uh, on what I'm missing, but a combination of uh, authentication or handing off authentication in some cases, if you're using SSO, uh, authorization, uh, but also the the transport mechanism of actually connecting to a remote host, whether it's a host or whether it's an application. So it seems like you're also doing like uh, SDP uh, type thing or ZTNA, I guess is, is what they call it now, but accessing an application without having to expose that application to, to the public internet. So like, That's like right. there's a lot going on there. Like, like, <laughs> Um, does that kind of cover it, or is there even more that, you, that uh, you're doing with Teleport? So I will try to describe Teleport using the simplest possible terms for technical people. So Teleport consists essentially of uh, like logical three components. Like all of Teleport is just like one file. It's a, it's a daemon. You can run it as a Linux daemon, or you can run it in a Kubernetes as a pod. Uh, but based on how, like, like which flags it takes as an input, it assumes the following responsibilities. So a teleport, first and foremost, is a, a certificate authority. So it, it gets connected to your source of identity in your organization. It could be like Active Directory, it could be Okta, it could be GitHub, it could be uh, Google Apps, whatever it is you use for like where your employees are stored or your engineers. So and then can issue certificates. So certificate authority is, is one component. The second component is a proxy. So what proxy does, it accepts inbound connections and then it routes them to their destinations semi-magically. But proxy requires the certificate to be on the wire. And if certificate is not there, then it will redirect you through your SSO to go and acquire a certificate. And final component is, let me just use the word sidecar or an agent. So that is a teleport thing that you're running next to your workload that actually speaks the protocol of the thing. So it could be SSH or it could be like MongoDB or whatever. So, and the way this works, and, uh, and this thing also establishes a reverse tunnel into the proxy. So, which basically means that all of your infrastructure dials into the proxy and kind of listens on that, on this tunnel continuously. Um, so, which means that your infrastructure doesn't listen on any ports, which is really important from a zero trust perspective. So a SSH box that Teleport is running on doesn't listen to any ports. Instead, it only accepts connections that are going through an established outbound tunnel through proxy. So if you have a, I don't know, self-driving vehicles or uh, like drones flying in the skies, you can still connect to them. It doesn't really matter where they are, simply because they register themselves with the proxy. And this also allows us to say that this is a true zero trust system of your data center. Everything is as secure as if it was outside. And, and then you have teleport client. It's the thing that you type TSH login and a command line. 
So that goes to the proxy, takes you through SSL, and it also configures your command line environment or your browser. So now the certificates are going to be automatically used for all of the connections that you're establishing. And after you authenticate it, you could use regular commands, you know, SSH, uh, MySQL. So they will just magically work simply because they already configured with certificates and with the proxy. So that it basically feels that your entire infrastructure is in, in the same room with you, like on your local network in your house. This is why we called it teleport. So I hope I've done a decent job explaining how everything works. I was going to ask you how it relates to zero trust, and you've given hints here and there, but you really just pulled it together in the last little bit. Um, yeah, like our view on zero trust is that networks don't matter at all. You cannot implement any sort of security on a network level. I know it's very controversial opinion, and a lot of uh, network-centric security companies will be disagreeing with me, but we believe that uh, security belongs uh, on application level. This is where we're enforcing it. And the, the, as, as I said already, teleport hosts, they don't listen to the network at all. Everything goes through proxy that the hosts them, themselves connect into. I think that's actual zero trust. If I conceptualize what I believe zero trust is, that's actual zero trust, not just like some marketing term we, we tend exactly. to Exactly. It, it means networks yeah. don't right. matter. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think it's less stressful <laughs> to manage it that way. <laughs> Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Like, yeah, that's ideal to me. Yeah, that's a great. That's a great tagline for you. Like less stressful management really is what, what we're talking about, Ev. That's that's great. <laughs> yeah, a abstract the network away. Well, I mean, well, the word abstract. You see, like some people have a PTSD reaction to that. Like <clears throat> high level abstractions, too many abstractions, like leaky abstractions. Uh, so let's just kind of stick to you. like. Yeah, like like jump boxes, like. <laughs> <laughs> Don't say that word. It makes me have like PTSD. I know, but it's like that. it's light years ahead of jump boxes, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah. When you when you go to the customers today, what are what are you just like? What's the range of what you're displacing? Is jump boxes has to be on that list, right? Uh, yes, we're displacing all kinds of uh, uh, like homegrown proxy solutions. Actually, the most popular way how most SaaS companies and what we've seen access infrastructure is a combination of two things. So they have some kind of jump box or a proxy and some kind of bag of secrets like on mm -hmm. the side and they try to kind of inject secrets on the fly. That's kind of really common pattern that people are doing. So what we're explaining to them is like the presence of a secret anywhere is a vulnerability. So put teleport in and then there are no secrets at all. Like you don't have to worry about uh, managing secrets, rotating secrets. Or See, I think that's the things. more controversial take. That's the more controversial yeah, take I agree. right there. Is the I agree. But I think it's important. I, 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 I get it now. Yeah, that's, yes, you did a great job explaining all of that. God is thinking what I think is way much more what we would call security for access to our, to our not just our systems, but services. Yeah, like uh, I wish that we we basically need a new term for this. Maybe a secretless uh, architecture, or maybe like identity uh, based is, is or identity passwordless. Not the. I thought passwordless was that term. Yeah, they say passwordless only refers to uh, like the one particular secret, and that's the password. But in this case, like we're getting rid of like private public SSH mm -hmm. keys. We, like you can get rid of API keys. Yeah. Like not, interesting. Like what is an API key? It's basically a password, it's a password. But for right. a computer. Right. Like not yet? not it, like not in the conversations <laughs> that I've had. In the conversations we've had over uh, on on the podcast that I run, Enterprise Security Weekly, passwordless uh, at its core is usually talking mm -hmm. about certificates, about some kind of passive authentication you know that where, where you don't have to remember or type in something or copy and paste something out of a out of a uh uh password database yep yep so i so i think they're we well, like and, 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 yeah and and that's one of those issues with uh with standards and terminology and uh security in general is uh different the same term means two different things to two different people often Yep. But we also uh, suffer a little bit from, let's call it legacy marketing, because we do have like this analyst, uh, like companies like Gardner, and they have this quadrant for privileged access management. And you can go <laughs> look up the definition, like what does it mean to be a privileged access management system? And you will see that must have features like password rotation. So which makes people feel like, okay, I, I need to have passwords and I need to be rotating them. So uh, which basically means that like 
no, like that that whole thing doesn't make sense anymore. Privileged access management is just a, it, it, it doesn't scale. Like it, it doesn't really work in a modern age where internet is turning into one giant machine. Well, if they didn't have that, that password rotation, Cyborg wouldn't pay them enough. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> destroying their business model man what's wrong with you no comment like i will say when, when that category of products was born when I mean, when this company started like way back it was probably the best solution at the time with the best trade-off and kind of you know cost of implementation usability and security so it's just no longer true ev we just have five questions left for you are you ready to play five questions with security weekly okay i'm shaking in anticipation there's Ooh. no right or wrong answer, so Ooh. you'll be fine. Uh, uh, three words to describe yourself. Um, engineer, nerd, uh, businessman. I like businessman. Yeah. <laughs> if you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? An explosive. Explosions are cool. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? I love that response, Con by the way. Converging Explosions are actions. cool. Like, <laughs> yeah. Um, like, I have to put a product in there. It's just like pushing, pushing progress forward or supplying ammo to people who are pushing progress forward, something like this. What is your favorite hacker movie? Hacker movie? Um... Uh, probably Fight Club. Oh, mm, nice. Interesting. Choose two celebrities to be your parents, alive, dead, fictional, or otherwise. Uh, two celebrities, Wes Anderson and uh, Guy Ritchie. Huh. Oh, that's pretty cool. So, so you like movies then? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I, I do like movies. Big, big movie. And I like those yeah. two particular parents. Yeah. Uh, that works for me. Heck yeah. <laughs> Ev, thank you so much for appearing on Paul Security Weekly this evening. I had a lot of fun. Thank you for having me. And make sure everyone visits securityweekly.com forward slash teleport. Coming up next, very special guest Casey Ellis will be joining us for the security news. Stay tuned.